Good evening, everyone. My name is Reverend Charles Maxwell, Senior Pastor of the Breakthrough Fellowship in Smyrna, Georgia. And we are excited to have you here tonight. This is the Breakthrough Fellowship Presents Real Talk with Reverend Cam. And I'm excited tonight because we brought together a group of medical experts and also some faith leaders to really talk about COVID-19 and the effects and the, I should say, what it means to the Black community. As you have seen, COVID-19 has ravished our country over the past year. Over 500,000 people have died and uh, the vaccines have come out, but a lot of people have missed I should say misgivings or even uh, misinformation about the vaccines. And so tonight, what we want to do is we want to debunk those issues. We want to make sure we answer your questions. And we, most importantly, we want to maybe, I should say, encourage you, if you have not taken the vaccine, to consider it, not only for yourself, but also for your family. I'm excited that we have some, some wonderful guests tonight. We have some medical experts who can speak to the issues. And then we also have some faith leaders who can also speak to it as well. And so we're going to get right into it, as they like to say, let's have real talk. And so we're going to start tonight with, uh, with Car um, Dr. Carlos Del Rio. You've seen him on CNN. You've also seen him across other uh, news outlets. He uh, is one of the professors at Emory uh, University and also at Grady Memorial Hospital. And we also have uh, Dr. Soleil Kendrick, who is a pediatrician and I should say a proud member of the Breakthrough Fellowship My Church, which I'm excited. And so we're excited to have both of you here tonight. So welcome to Real Talk. Happy to be with you. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. L let me ask you a, a basic question. And I'll start with Dr. Del Rio. You know, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a husband, um, a son. You know, one, one of the things that uh, really kind of worried me was what, what was going to be the effects of taking the vaccines? And maybe just in broad strokes, why is it important for everyone to get vaccinated? Well, thank you for asking that question. I think it's important that everybody gets vaccinated because the vaccines are the way we're gonna get out of this pandemic. It's gonna give us protection as an individual, but as you get more and more individuals protected, then you start having something that in the medical terms, we say, we call it herd immunity, but I like to call it community immunity. If your community is immune, you protect your community. And whether your community is your family, your circle of friends, or your church, protecting your community then allows you to more comfortably be within that community and be protected from the infection coming. So I think the most important thing you can do as an individual and as a member of the community is to get vaccinated because the sooner we get to community immunity, the sooner we'll be out of this problem. Great, that's great. So the sooner we can vaccinate, the sooner we get out of this problem. Dr. Sully, this is my question for you. One of the, one of the issues is, is how is it gonna affect maybe people I would say children, because uh, recently um, they've said that if, if someone is 16 years of age, they can get they can get vaccinated. What would you say to parents who are considering possibly getting their children vaccinated? Well, um, I would encourage them to at least consider getting their children vaccinated. I have an appointment for my 16 year old to get vaccinated tomorrow. So we are super excited. Um, Knowing that the older kids are often affected, we actually have treated more than 2,000 kids um, for in the hospital for COVID-19 infection. And so we know that older children can get pretty sick from COVID-19 infection, but we do wanna protect our family. And by protecting our family, we're protecting our community. And we know that by getting the vaccine, it does decrease risk of hospitalization, risk of severe infection and risk of death. And so we still need to continue to wear masks, to socially distant, for our younger kids, we know that younger children aren't actually spreaders of infection, but they do carry and um, can be asymptomatic carriers and they don't necessarily, um, they're not um, high risk of spreading, but we do want to protect our the people that they are around and our families. And so by getting children um, vaccinated, we are doing our due diligence to offer protective measures. And right now there's several um, <clears throat> studies, one that just completed and hopefully we'll have the information out soon for kids who were 12 and up. And there's ongoing studies for kids six months, starting six months to age 11 going on right now. So hopefully we'll have that information of what the data shows for them. 
And because we know that children aren't just little adults, it's great that they're doing some due diligence on those studies. Um, but I do look forward to seeing a lot more vaccinated children in our community for protection, reduced spread, reduced risk, and then we can all get back to the new normal of what we can do in, in being involved and grandparents seeing their grandchildren and spending time with family and community. I like that. I like that. I like to call it the new better. We don't want us to go back to the yes. old normal. We want to have the new better. Exactly. So I, I do like that. And, and it's important for us as uh, as parents and also as community leaders and people in the community to get vaccinated. But the, Dr. Del Rio, this this is the question. You know, I took the Pfizer vaccine. My in laws took the Moderna. There is the Johnson and Johnson. There is the uh, the new one that's coming out. What 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 should we take? I think that's the question. And which one is better? Is there one better than the other, or are they all the same? Well, you know, uh, Reverend, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and my, my answer to people is the, trust the FDA. The FDA has done its due diligence. If it's a vaccine approved by the FDA, take it. So take whatever becomes available. It's a little bit like if a boat was sinking and you started to say, well, should I take the green life jacket or the red life jacket? You take whatever life jacket you can get your hands on. So at this point in time, getting the vaccine you can get is really what we ought to be doing and, and, and have confidence in the process. I think one agency that has work really well is the FDA. They resisted any pressures to approve things. They have been incredibly transparent. You, you, they have posted all the information on the internet from the different vaccines. They have made the discussion meetings open to the public. You can watch them in the internet. So I think the FDA has really done a tremendous job to be transparent, to show the information for us scientists to look at. And quite frankly, I feel that if they approve something, we should trust it in any of us, any of the three vaccines currently approved by the FDA, I would say take whichever you can get first. That's a great point. So, so don't worry about which one you take. Don't worry about the efficacy. Don't don't get caught up in all that. Just take whatever you can put in your arm. Let, let me ask a follow-up you know, question. I would, say, I would say that some people though, and I see especially young people say, I wanna get the, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine because it's one do, one shot, get done and be done. And that is, that is a, a, a fair assessment. You know, that having a two-shot vaccine requires a little bit of getting a second appointment and doing this, doing that. I wish we had more Johnson & Johnson vaccines because quite frankly, a one-dose vaccine is a lot, lot easier to take than a two-dose vaccine, but we don't have enough of them. So take whatever that's out there. Let me, let me drill down on that because I think that's where there's been some misinformation. You know, not to call anyone out, but there was a, a public official in Michigan when uh, when offered that one dose vaccine um, gave the inference that potentially that one dose could be inferior i would i would love for both of you to talk about that again and why that may or may not be the case because i think that's some of the misinformation or maybe the the questions that people are having about taking that one and then maybe let me just stop right there if you could answer that one that would be great so um Dr. Del Rio probably knows a little more about this, but I know that um, there's some issues with the, some concerns, I should say, that people have had some myths about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine besides that one. But um, that one is that after 14 days, there was a, a 70 plus 76% um, efficacy with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But after 28 days, there was an 85% efficacy, which is actually really great. Um, and so many of our vaccines have that level of efficacy that we use. And so it's perfectly fine. Um, and that's in vitro. And the key is that with all of these vaccines, when we look at death from COVID-19 um, infection, it was 100% efficacy. And so that's what we're trying to prevent here. And I think that that's the, the main point, death from COVID-19, right? Because that's what we're, we're looking at and hospitalization so from severe infection. And so those are the things that we're trying to prevent in our community. And that's what everyone is, is upset about in this pandemic. And that's what we're trying to stop. And so when we're looking at these things and we speak of efficacy, we're looking at um, the risk of death from the disease. And so that's a key point. Yeah, that's I mean, I, I, I totally agree uh, with Dr. Salima. I think that's exactly right. I think you cannot compare these different vaccines. And that's, I think, an important point. 
they were not studied side by side. So making comparison is simply not right. It's, again, comparing apples and oranges, and you can't do that. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson and the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine were studied in different environments at different times in the pandemic in different places. All we can say is that three of them are highly efficacious, as it was previously said, to prevent severe disease. And at the end of the day, what you want to is prevent severe disease. And they're actually pretty good at preventing also you from getting infected and developing even mild disease. But they're all very, very effective to preventing severe disease. And that, as we said over and over, is what we want to avoid. And I want to, to just use, use a second of your time to emphasize something. You said at the beginning, rightly, that this pandemic has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities and how we see enormous health inequalities and inequities in this pandemic. And this is not the first disease that has health inequities. We see them all the time and we want to end them. And I think one thing that I tell people about the vaccines, well, why to take the vaccine is because this is an opportunity to offer immunological equity to everybody, regardless of your color, of your race, of your ethnicity, of who you are, or your ability to pay. These vaccines are free. You can get them. Nobody's going to ask you if you're a citizen or not. Get the vaccine because if we can get the population vaccinated, we will achieve immunological equity. And that may be the first time we actually have equity in something in this country. That, that's a great that's a great point, Dr. Del Rio. Great point. And that's one of the things we're trying to definitely get out. Again, this is a real talk with Reverend Cam. We are excited to have a group of medical experts and also some faith leaders. I'm, I'm gonna make one statement and I wanna actually bring in uh, Reverend Watley, um, Reverend Matthew Watley to speak because he was part of the clinical trials in Maryland. And and so that, I think the, uh, the equity issue is important. Could, could you maybe talk why is it so important for black and brown communities to be a part of the clinical trials? Because I think a lot of people think historically about what happened with Tuskegee and their own dis, rightly so, the systematic racism against people who have been black and brown. Why is this different? Why is this moment different? And why is it so important for them not only to take the vaccine, but to be a part of the trials? Sure. Dr. Great Del Rio, Dr. Thank Ken. You. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think it's really important that we understand that when we talk about the vaccine that they are producing, that really is a misnomer. We have been instrumental as African-Americans, particularly in the development, the distribution uh, and the testing of this vaccine. So very specifically, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, African-American woman in her thirties uh, was the lead uh, on the uh, development of, the, uh, of many of the vaccines that are now either already approved or in the process of being approved. The, the four medical HBCUs, Howard, Meharry, uh, Morehouse and Charles Drew are each conducting trials uh, for the continued uh, for the vaccines that are still in process. So these are developed by African Americans. These are being tested by African Americans. African Americans have participated in the trials. I'm one of them. I took the Novavax uh, vaccine at the Howard University Hospital, and I know I got the real thing and not the placebo uh, because I did get the side effects. I was the only person in the country praying for side effects after the second shot, because that would be confirmation that I got the real thing. And it's important for us to understand that this is a double blind placebo uh, trial. It's the highest standard, right? So that means that when the when the results come in, they don't come to the, the pharmaceutical companies for them to figure with the, with the data, nor do they go uh, directly to the FDA. It goes to a third party independent panel that then verifies the data and then shares with the FDA and with the pharmaceutical companies. And so this is a, <clears throat> it's a very high standard. And so when African-Americans wonder, rightfully so, can we trust this as was indicated earlier? There were attempts by the prior uh, presidential administration to, to undermine the regulatory process and it didn't work. I have the luxury of living in suburban DC. And so I have members who work at the FDA and the NIH and the CDC. And so I know people who are readily involved in this this is us. It's one thing when we say we can't trust them, but when we say we can't trust us, we've got a whole nother issue. Lastly, I will say, if you want to be conspiratorial, here's the conspiracy. Wait for there to be a pandemic that's disproportionately affecting African-Americans and then convince African-Americans not to take it, not to take the one medical intervention that's proven to be 100% effective in preventing death. 
That's the conspiracy. Everything else uh, really is, it doesn't make sense. When people share these videos on social media, uh, I always remind them, before you send me the video, here's what I can tell you about it. It doesn't agree with the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, the WHO, um, the NMA, the AMA. So, and so it's not just America, right? The world agrees that this is the way to solve the problem. Excellent. I would, Excellent. I would just add, I would just add to that that when we talk about Tuskegee, Tuskegee was a horrible event in which treatment was actually not given to people for for syphilis. It was withholding treatment from people. So as was just said uh, by Reverend, by the Reverend, you know, if we withhold the vaccine from African Americans, that is the issue. But we don't need to withhold it. We need to give it to them, and therefore we need to increase access to those communities. As an investigator in the Moderna vaccine study over at Grady Hospital, we made a specific effort to have a, a site at Grady Hospital so we can enroll African Americans and minority populations into the study. And we were very, very happy that over 48% of our participants in the clinical trial at our site were African American. Excellent. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. And this is back on that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just want to piggyback on that because I find that, you know, those are all excellent points. And I find a lot of the arguments um, or mis misperceptions about vaccines is that people, one, misunderstand the Tuskegee experiment and use that a lot for not getting vaccinated, but also they don't um, understand vaccines in general. So just as a baseline, Vaccines do not keep you from getting disease or getting sick. Vaccines prime your immune system. And so I usually put things in layman's terms, like they, they basically act, a vaccine basically acts like an alarm system for your body to know when you are being attacked by an enemy. And so, I sometimes say it's like a bar where your enemies are hanging out in the bar. You don't even recognize them because it's so dark and you're going in. So on one hand, if you're unvaccinated and you go into the bar and you sit down for a drink and you're talking to somebody, but and you have your phone directly in your hand. And before you know it, you're getting beat to a pulp with broken ribs and bloody you know, you're all messed up, basically. And by the time you push the button on your phone to get your friends there to help you, you're going to end up in the hospital for months and needing rehab. And so that's what it's like walking around unvaccinated versus some vaccines like the flu vaccine, for example, behaves as a vaccine that assists you by saying, OK, you step in the door and you immediately recognize these aren't my people, but you're still going to go in, except your friends are right behind you. And so they're there prepared for you all to go ahead and brawl it out, knowing that you have way more friends that are in that that are in that bar. OK, and so that you are prepared. And so that's what having a vaccine is like, whereas the COVID-19 vaccine is like you've seen mug shots all over your neighborhood of what those people look like. And so when you walk into that bar, you immediately start recognizing, wait, these people are not right. I'm not even going in. Or when I go in, I already have my friends around the corner right there with me. And you're still just as prepared because you have that mugshot. And so that's the difference between an mRNA vaccine versus a regular vaccine that has just a piece, a tiny inactivated piece of the protein. And so understand what vaccines are for and how they work. And I think people have the misconception that vaccines are supposed to keep you from getting sick. So the moment they have a side effect, they think the vaccine made them sick and we gave them something that was wrong. And so I think that's an important baseline understanding to have. I love it. I love it. That's the historically black college experience coming out about being in bars <laughs> and seeing games. So we, we know that this film lady right here we love it. We love it. Again, this Walking is Walking to the Martyr Station. <laughs> On the way to Lenny Small, right? Yes. <laughs> Talking about the COVID-19, the vaccine, and the Black community. COVID-19, the vaccine, the Black community. We are broadcasting this not only on Zoom. And so if you're on Zoom, you can actually put your questions in the chat feature. And we're going to take those questions. We're going to transition in one second. 
but we're also broadcasting this on Facebook and also on YouTube. Just go to the Breakthrough Fellowship page and you'll be able to see this as well. Let me also just thank one of our sponsors who really kind of helped us get this out. We want to thank Radio One Atlanta for all of their help on making sure that we get the message out. Now I would like to transition because uh, our, our, our other panelists, and we thank them so much, raised a lot of different issues about the vaccine and why it's so important for us to take it. But one of the things that I experienced myself, my father and my mother, both of them were of age and we we're trying to get the vaccine to them. But the distribution has been very, very challenging in some respects. And here in the state of Georgia, the governor recently just said that anyone over the age of 16 can get the vaccine. And so I want to bring to the conversation Dr. Lynn Paxson, Fulton County Board of Health. And uh, Dr. Paxson, welcome to Real Talk with Reverend Cam. Thanks for having me. One of the questions I have, th thank you for being here. One, one of the questions I have for you is now, it seems the governor has, in some respects, opened up the spigot. But the, the issue that, that I see and that a lot of people are facing is how do they get the appointment? And, and what are we doing as a state and what are we doing as a nation to make it easier for people to get vaccinated? From your perspective, yeah. what, what, what are the things that we're doing well and what do we need to do better, especially in the black and brown groups? Sure. Well, there's a lot to unpack here. So I'm going to start off with the higher level and work my way down. I think the most important thing we did to improve distribution is we elected a new administration. And that um, since that has happened, we have seen the president uh, come, he has made a promise. He had made a promise to have, uh, you know, 100 million uh, people vaccinated in the first 100 days, and we're already ahead of that. So, you know, I have lived through the entire vaccine distribution uh, rollout, and it was um, it was hard in the beginning because we have, for example, in Fulton County, we have 1.1 million people. Yet, uh, our first allocations of doses were on the order of like maybe 6,000 a week, uh, maybe 9,000 a week, maybe 10 on a, you know on a good week. So it simply wasn't enough to you know to go around. So uh, and, uh, and then in addition to that, we were of course struggling with some basic logistical things, such as um, there had been no um, there was a, a, not a good uh, appointment system. Our appointment system uh, things were crashing. Uh, you know we had the demand so far outstripped the uh, you know the supply that it was just not it was almost impossible for everyone to get. Um, uh, to get a vaccine. Now, what I can say though, is that things have markedly improved in the uh, last several weeks. Um, and um, here in Fulton County, we have just started a collaboration, which was officially kicked off today uh, with uh, FEMA and GEMA, in which um, this is uh, occurring out of Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where Fulton has been working for since January. But uh, since uh, today, we have started this new initiative in which we're um, going to be uh, providing 42,000 doses per week for uh, at, at least the next eight weeks. And so therefore we have a lot more um, uh, appointments available. And uh, it, we were actually getting to the point after, as you well know, we started with a, very, with a tiered system in which the first people who are eligible to be vaccinated were, were healthcare workers and people who were residents or staff of a, of a long-term care facility. And then gradually uh, the governor went at, was adding people to, uh, you know, populations to this, um, to the eligibility character um, thing. And so we were able to slowly but surely, we're working our way, way through all that. Um, we're now getting to the point where, um, a point that all of us in the know who work in public health uh, assume that we will eventually reach in that we knew that at the beginning, because of the um, shortage of supplies, that there was going to be high demand and people unable to um, to get you know an appointment you know easily and all that. But we've always expected that as you get more and more um, people vaccinated and they're effectively taken out of the population that needs vaccination, that at some point we were going to get to a point where we poss possibly had more vaccine available than people who wanted to take it or, or like. And so we're not quite there yet, but we're Dr. dealing with, we're starting to think ahead to that. 
But let me ask you a question with that. You know, one, one, of the, one of the challenges people have is that yes, the vaccine is out there and it's somewhat available, but what happens in the black and brown communities when people don't necessarily have access to computers mm -hmm. or maybe have access to, to get online? Because what we have seen mm -hmm or at least heard, is people from other communities have come in and taken those spots. What, what is Fulton County doing to assure that the people who need to get vaccinated are getting vaccinated? Thank you for that lead in because that's what I, I really am here to talk about. Um, we recognized early on um, that uh, in the very beginning, you know, we would go to at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, I'd look around and it was mainly uh, white people, you know, in the there who were getting who were getting vaccinated, and so we could we recognized extremely early on that we needed to make much better outreach to to people of color. So Fulton County has at least I would I keep, I would talk about our four pronged approach, but it's now getting to be like a six pronged approach, and it's, and it's growing prongs every day. Um, what we have uh, what we have been doing is targeted outreach to uh, communities of color. We are well aware that many people, particularly older people, may not have access to the internet, may not be conversant with it, they don't have the time or the um, energies to be able to spend hours online looking for an open appointment. So we quickly set up a program in which we're working with um, Fulton County Senior Services to identify all the uh, people who are already accessing senior services and to contact them individually, every one of them, to, um, to make appointments for them to be vaccinated and for those people who needed it uh, to arrange transportation and in some cases to even assign an escort for them to, to, to go with them to, um, to, to fill out the paperwork and all that. That was one of the first things we did. The other thing that we did is we worked again with senior services and all that to set aside a certain number of doses every week, just for what we call the equity initiative. To these are basically four people in this in the community of color that these were these were avail these doses were available. They could not be snapped up by anyone else. In addition, we are working with the churches. Um, and so we have a whole list of, of people, of churches we've already worked with and who had contact and others who've also contacted and said they want to be a vaccination site. So we have, we're evaluating them and we're working with them. Last week we worked with Mount Zion Baptist Church. This week we're at Ebenezer Baptist Church and every, every, um, uh, every week we're working with another one. And I can, I'm going to go on and on for a little bit more. We have other things that we have global vaccination units that are going out. I love your, I love and your passion. There's so much. So, I mean, I, I guess you can stop me because I have, we have so many things that we are doing to uh, work with this. At this point, I want to bring in uh, Dr. William D. Watley, senior pastor of St. Philip Amy Church. You talk about churches mm -hmm. being brought part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I want to definitely get his perspective. Again, this is a real talk with Reverend Cam. We we're talking about the COVID-19, the vaccine and the black community. And I'm excited to have a Reverend Dr. William D. Watley, senior pastor, to be here. His church, St. Philip, partnered with Walgreens to be one of those vaccination sites that the governor recently um, visited. Dr. Watley, thank you for being here with Real Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me? Well, I can hear you. You're, you're fine. My, my question for you is, why was it important for you as a pastor, and why was it important for your church to partner with Walgreens and be a distribution site for the vaccine. Let, let, let me begin by saying that um, um, I'm the apostle Paul in this group. I'm like one untimely born because um, I was part of the group that, uh, that approached the whole vaccination development with the hermeneutic of suspicion, partly hostility. Uh, Tuskegee, experiment that started in 1932. I was born in 1947, which means I have a whole lifetime of seeing the inequitable uh, mistreatment of black people by white systems. And my conversion came through my son, my daughter, and you. You know, I've lived long enough to 
know that sometimes it really does pay to listen to your children, who, um, who told me about how this vaccine has been developed and what I had to learn. Uh, my demographic was that this is not that. And, and so that is what I've had to tell persons of my demographic, that those of us who are older cannot blame a current and contemporary medical research for racism of the past and that this vaccine has been developed by, by very competent, committed black people as well as white systems. When, and, and so when, when the vaccine came out, I, uh, I called all over town trying to find one. My, my uh, mother at 91 had COVID. My wife lives with uh, uh, pre-existing conditions, and uh, I'm of the age where uh, I need as much help as I can. And and so I, I think I was able to get vaccinated before anyone in the family, along with with the elders. Um, and 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 I began to see the importance of places in our community. What convinced me was I believed in the credibility of the people who uh, were telling me that it was safe. And because I believed in their credibility, I then was able to listen and to the research with an open mind. And so we, we, we began several months ago to uh, say that if you really are serious, about vaccinating the black community. And I get so tired of hearing us referred to as the underserved community. Um, then that those centers ought to be in places in the black community that have credibility. And, um, and frankly, um, the DeKalb County was open. Our, our blockage came from the state, we even called FEMA. And mm -hmm. we were kind of dismissed with this attitude, don't call us, we'll call you. That has changed. Right. And because we discovered that that the, the, the majority, we, I looked up and in DeKalb County, which is 85% black, 70% of the vaccinations were going to the white community. And, and, and so, uh, through the through the vision of of the mayor of Atlanta and the vision of the CEO of DeKalb County, uh, contact was made with Wall with Walgreen almost almost at Wall Street Walgreens, who um, who we partnered with, and what Walgreens did for us was that they gave us our own link, so people had to call the church. And it was not just the fact that the older people, who older than me, could not, did not have the technological ability. We were on the phone with their children who told us that I've been trying to get an appointment with my mother and my father and my grandmother for a long time and have not been able to do it. And because, and they appreciated the direct contact that right. um, that they were able to make with us. And so a uh, week before last, uh, we uh, partnering with Walgreens, we vaccinated uh, 3,650, 650 people, six, you know, 650 people. And then last year, last week, uh, we, we vaccinated closed vaccination for the educators of DeKalb County, another 11, 1100 vaccinations, which means we've done about 5,511 5, vaccinations over the next 
That's last two work. weeks. We have been now in partnership with the mayor's office of Atlanta, and we are scheduling the, the, the mayor and the top staff to be vaccinated next week. And so that's because, that's and people have felt gratified, touched, and are anxious to get vaccinated if there is proper access and communication. That's, that's great, Dr. Watley. Do, Dr. Paxton, let me, let me come back to you on this. You, you just heard Dr. Watley talk about St. Philip and the fact that over 3,000 people got vaccinated. It, it would seem to me that if we really want to vaccinate more and more people in the black and brown community, that not only the cab but Fulton, Cobb County would call every black pastor in this area and, and turn every sanctuary into a vaccination site. Um, you mentioned a couple of churches, but why, why haven't we thought big? If, if we really want to get to the people, I know Mercedes Benz is open and, and it's, but why don't we just go to the black churches where most of black people look at the black church and I'm a proponent of the black church. Most of the people look at the black church, not only as a bastion of hope and deliverance, but also a place of safety and comfort. Why, 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 what, what is Folkston County doing in a big way to partner with black churches? I don't want to be heretical here, but I'm going to say, uh, say a few things. One is we are actually doing a lot with, with the churches. We have, you know, but, and, and we are, we are contacted, we have several that we're working with and we're going to continue to work with and to continue to, um, to have more units going out and to working with the, with the black churches. And so we fully understand that the, they are, as you said, they're bastions of trust um, you know, in the in the black community. Here's the heretical thing, and you're probably going to say, well, why is she saying this on this particular program? But we also, as a health department, we have to think of all the ways that we can reach people of color in this uh, organization. And the black churches are obviously extremely, extremely, extremely important. But what we also know is that while they'll reach a lot of people, they won't necessarily reach everyone. And we have to cater to that. And, and as I can say, I can look no further than my own family to give an example of how we have to think very broadly. For example, my father was an elder in his church. So of course he was at church every Sunday and uh, many other times during the week. My mother was a little bit less religious so she would go, you know, not as frequently as my father, but she would go uh, to church. And so they would obviously have been reached by, you know, a, a, a strictly church-based um, uh, outreach. However, my father would also affectionately call me and my younger brother and my younger sister his resident heathens because we did not attend church as much. We do, however, and we still continue, we would uh, frequent uh, my, my brother, the barber shops. You know, he goes, he goes there. I have natural hair. I go to um, you know a, a you know, particular salon that deals with that. Uh, we are all my 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 eighteen year old daughter, who by the way also has just been vaccinated. Um, she uh, goes to the library. We all go to the library. We all go to the grocery stores. So what we realize is we are uh, in no way ignoring the black churches because we actually understand thoroughly their trusted position in the um, in in the community. And it would be foolish to not uh, exploit that as much as we can. But we also need to recognize that not everyone in, in the in the in the uh, people of color in the communities of people of color are solely dependent on that. So we are making a point of catering to all of these, and we have um, we are having a, a program that we're working with with Core to have um, mobile units going to some of the um, uh, various events that like there, there are a number of marches that are going to be taking place in the next couple of weeks. So we are going to be there with our either vaccination units then, or uh, a system in which we can make people, uh, make um, uh, guaranteed appointments for people at those um, at those places. So we want to be inclusive of all, of, of, of where everyone is and where everyone goes. Your, your point is well taken. The problem is you're talking to a black preacher and, and the world begins. I know. I, I knew I was taking the chance there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I want to ask mm -hmm. one more question of Reverend Watley and Dr. Watley, and then I'm going to segue to 
some of the questions because we've gotten some questions in the chat. And so uh, Reverend Watley and Dr. Wiley, again, this is Real Talk with Reverend Cam, the COVID-19 um, vaccinations in the black community. I want to ask one question of Reverend Watley and Dr. Watley. And this question is simply, we were talking about the church itself. Both of you have been at the forefront of speaking about this issue from, from a faith perspective, but there have been some people who have pushed back to say, one, biblically, um, there is, they, they find the vaccines to be problematic because of the use of stem cells. And then from an ethical perspective, they also have raised issues. Um, we have a couple minutes. Could, could either, either one or both of you speak to that issue from your perspective? Because I think it's important for people to understand it from an ethical and also from a theological standpoint, what faith leaders believe in this moment. Sure. So, so let me just say very quickly a couple things. One, um, you can't make a case, a biblical case, that the Bible does not speak to stem cells, like it doesn't speak to any number of very specific contemporary issues, right? So you can have an interpretation, but that interpretation is just that. And quite frankly, is a minority view uh, in terms of my understanding of the Christian community and the Holy Writ. So that, that's just the, so we have to make a distinction between biblical interpretation and the doctrine of a specific denomination or, right, that's important to distinguish. What we do know is that the Bible is very affirming of medicine uh, throughout and that uh, medical interventions are large part of the Christian and church tradition, which is why you have Presbyterian hospitals and Baptist hospitals and Adventist hospitals and the like. And so this sort of distinction uh, is really sort of a false choice between faith and uh, medicine. I've been on a number of these panels and had the opportunity to be on uh, with one uh, with uh, Dr. Horace Smith, who is a medical trained doctor who participated in trials uh, at University of um, uh, in Chicago and also is a practicing apostolic pastor. And he said, for those who think this is a faith issue, if it's all about faith, then you need to stop you know, using your car and just ask the Lord to transport you to where you need to go and, you know, and, and the like. The, the, the bottom line for me is that we are making this so much harder than it has to be. We are at, we are nowhere near as faithful a people as there were in this country 60 or 70 years ago when uh, vaccines like polio and tuberculosis came out. And those people had no, no concerns from a faith perspective. And interestingly, they had no concerns from a scientific perspective. Now, what's interesting is, and you can read the article in the New York Times about how 6 million people in New York were vaccinated within two months, that you have to ask this question. Did science get better or worse in the last 60 or 70 years? Because one of the myths I hear all the time is, well, it just happened too quickly. You know, that's, I mean, what in, in terms of science do we expect to go more slowly, right? So I expect my computer in 2021 to be much faster than my computer from 2015, right? So the processes or them are, have been aided by scientific breakthrough. And so it, it really is a misnomer. It really is a matter of not it, uh, people having a sliver of information, a lot of, of suspicion and putting those two things together. I'll close with this. For those who look at other citizens and their belief in the QAnon conspiracy or their belief that the election was stolen. And you're saying, how could any rational thinking person believe that? Before you judge them, ask yourself, am I the black QAnon version of the same uh, thinking? That I start off with suspicion and no matter what evidence is put before me, I push it away and guarding my original assumption that something is wrong. The truth of the matter is, according to uh, the news two days ago, one in four Americans has been vaccinated. If these things weren't safe, we would know. And mind you, these this is in addition to all those who've been vaccinated during the trials and have had much longer runway, not to mention the millions of people all over the world who have been vaccinated. You don't know, no one watching me right now knows a person who died from taking the vaccine, but all of us know people who died from the virus. At the end of the day, it's that simple. Dr. Wickler, I know um, you want to get in here. I need to open it up for one second. Yeah. 10 minutes left, and I want to bring in all the panelists so we can answer some questions. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Just, I know you want okay. to say something. I can, I, I can do mine. The, um, 
the um, the medicine is a tool of faith. It is not anti-faith. Just read Isaiah 38, and you will see where uh, the um, where the prophet tells Hezekiah that he's going to die. Hezekiah prays. The prophet tells him he will live. And then he says, put a lump of figs on his body that he might be healed. He's spoken a word of healing, and yet he uses a medical procedure. Thank you. That's a word for the people right there. Medicine is a tool of faith. Medicine is a tool of faith. Again, this is a Real Talk with Reverend Cam. That's real talk right there. Thank you, Dr. Watley. Um, to all of our guests, we have some uh, we have some questions here. I want to rapidly go through these questions, and so I'm going to hold you to a, a short answer. Um, Dr. Del Rio, one question came through on the on the chat. What is what is the magic number that will consider that we would consider to be herd immunity? Is there a, a natural percentage that we need to get to as a as a nation? Well, we we don't really absolutely know, but between people infected and people vaccinated, we may need to get because especially because the new variants, we may need to get upwards of eighty percent. So you're talking about maybe right now twenty percent, eighteen twenty percent of the U.S. population vaccinated, and maybe another twenty percent having uh, had the disease. We're still halfway there, if at all. So we have a long way to go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Soleil. You talked about the. Uh vaccinations and the after effects you know how long how long does it protect 19 do we have a sense of how long it will protect us if you actually take the actual vaccine so right now we have the idea is a year um so far but we don't know yet so it'll be continued study since it's a novel so, virus and a novel vaccine so the follow-up question is, do we see this being an annual issue for, for us to have to take these vaccines? And the doctors, anyone can answer that question. Is this something we have to do every maybe. year? Maybe. One word, maybe. We don't know yet. Okay. We don't know. I take a flu shot every year, so what's the problem? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We take a flu shot. You know, one of the questions is the side effects. I. Uh, I turned 50 years old recently and uh, I went to the pharmacy. They said, not only do I need to take the flu shot, but I also need to take the uh, shingle shot. The second shot, the first shot was fine. The second shot kind of get, kind of put me back. I'm getting ready to take my second shot of COVID pretty soon. For the people who are listening, I survived. It was no big issue. But uh, maybe speak to the side effects, if there are any that are major. Can someone speak to that? I like to call them not side effects, but what we the term we use in vaccinology is reactogenicity. This is your body reacting. As Dr. Salini said, this is your immune system getting ready. So I'm glad you have that reaction. I would tell you this vaccine is a lot less reactogenic than the Shingris vaccine. Having had that, that's pretty tough. It's a little more reactogenic than the flu vaccine. But the reactogenicity lasts 24, 48 hours, and then you're done. And I will tell you the bad news is the older you get, the less likely you are to have reactogenicity. So that's called immune senescence. You get old and your immune system just doesn't do a good job. If you had COVID before and you get the vaccine, you're likely going to have more reactogenicity because you've already seen that virus. What's the reactogenicity? Pain at the sign of infection, uh, injection, a little bit of uh, fatigue, not feeling good, headache, uh, fever, but that's about it. See, Dr. Del Rio, you just made me feel good. You mean, since I had a reaction, that means I'm still a young man. I, I appreciate you saying that. And so, <laughs> so I appreciate you saying that. Um, one other question along that line. Do the current vaccines work against the new variants of UK and Brazil? That's, that's also the other question that's been in the chat. Can someone speak to that issue? It depends where you're looking at. In real yeah. life, they work, they work really well against the UK variant against the Brazil variant and against the South African variant, they don't work as well to prevent infection, but they still prevent pretty well to prevent severe disease, death, and, and hospitalization. And it's important mind. to note that all the, com the companies are following this, and so that they are really primed to, to react. And if, a, if boosters are needed, then we should be able to find out about that fairly soon. Reverend Wantley, if, if, if we... Um... If a clinical trial came open and, and one of our listeners had the opportunity to, to be a part of it, what would you say to them? 
I would highly recommend it. In fact, my daughter, who is at 10 years old, uh, insisted that I enroll her in the first uh, child vax uh, trial that would be available. Uh, one, it's kind of your way to get in, cut the line. Uh, but more importantly, it is a way to assure others that the vaccine is safe for people who look like you. And that's why I did it. Many members of our church, I encouraged them and they did it as well. And all of them were very excited about it. And, and quite frankly, have thanked many of us because they recognize we're trying to be helpful. To it. At some point, we have to stop getting into narcissistic insularity when we're into ourselves and off to ourselves. We have to start being considerate of others as well. Amen, amen, good talk right there. Again, this is Real Talk with Reverend Cam. Um, COVID-19, the vaccine in the black community. We wanna also thank one of our other promotional sponsors, which was Project Light, which is a group of uh, friends of mine from uh, Leadership Atlanta who have come together to go against systematic racism. So we wanna thank them for being one of our promotional sponsors. Dr. Paxton, I'm gonna come back to you for one more question. If someone is trying to find a site in Fulton County, where should they go? The best thing for anybody who wants to find a, a get an appointment is to go to the Georgia Department of Health website because there you can find information about how you can you can put in your name where you live and then you can find out where are the closest appointments to you if you do not have access to the um uh to the internet and all that you can always call the COVID hotline number hotline number at uh, fulton county which is 404-613-8150 and somebody that will be there to help you and to make an appointment for We'll make sure we post that to this as well. So we have this out there. Two more questions for the doctors. Um, there was a question about wearing masks, social distancing and washing your hands. Even after you've taken the vaccine, should you still wash your hands, social distance and wear your mask? Yes. I, I hope that yes. everybody washes their hands every day. <laughs> Always wash your hands. <laughs> hey, I don't think people wash their hands before COVID. So let me say that. <laughs> um, here's another question. If, if you have been vaccinated and you're going on a trip in July, would you recommend those people still go on that trip in July or should they wait until uh, maybe the fall before they take, take trips? Well, I actually did just have to deal with this idea. I've been vaccinated since uh, I got my first, I was the first person in Fulton County Board of Health to get vaccinated. So I've been vaccinated you know, for a while. Um, however, you have to look at where you're going, you know, and sort of what the prevalence is there. Uh, to you know, that 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 factors into the into the consideration. Also, there's also the logistics about what does what does the receiving place require in terms of vaccination, in terms of all that. I made the personal decision to hold off, um, okay. you know, until we are farther along with getting people vaccinated. We're farther along in this uh, uh, banishing this epidemic. So use common yeah. sense. Use with the guy I, game. I, I, I agree with Dr. Paxton. I think you look at where you're going to. I have traveled. In fact, I'm traveling this this weekend for a personal reason. But you are, need to continue wearing your mask. You need to continue being careful. I would not go to a crowded place. I'm still not eating indoors in restaurants. I'm still, you know, not doing anything like that. And I also incorporate testing into what I do. In many places, you know, I get tested if I'm going to travel three days before I leave. I get tested. And after I arrive at that place, I get tested four to five days later. I think it's important to not just rely on the vaccine. If you're going to travel, you got to do other additional steps to not only to keep yourself safe, safe, but to keep others you're going to be in contact with safe. That's great. And last question, exactly. homopathic methods, homopathic yes. methods. Oh. We're asking about homopathic yes. methods. Would you recommend homopathic methods as a way of combating COVID-19 or would you just suggest that they take the shot? Take the shot. The vaccine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's fine to do homeopathic methods, but you still need the shot. You still need to wash your hands. You still need to socially distance, and you still need to wear your mask. I, I wish I had more time. It's uh, it's the top of the hour. This the sixty minutes went by so qu so quickly. There's so many things I want to ask you guys. We may have to do this again. Again, we want to thank uh, Dr. Soleil. Um, Kindred for being a part of this conversation. We want to thank Dr. Del Rio for being a part of this conversation. Dr. Paxson, thank you as much. Again, we're going to make sure everyone goes to the Fulton County website to get uh, 
to get the information needed to sign up. Um, Dr. Watley, thank you for letting me uh, cut the line, and I shouldn't say cut the line, be a part of the people who uh, were able to come to your church to get vaccinated. I forget this is being broadcasted. And then Reverend Watley, mm -hmm. we thank you for being a leader in this space and adding your voice to this conversation. Again, this is Real Talk with uh, Reverend Cam, COVID-19, the vaccine in the black community. Let me let me just end by, by, by summing up kind of the main message. And actually Reverend Watley had this on his Instagram page. He simply said this, he said, the vaccine, the, the virus kills, the vaccine saves lives. Let, let me say that again, because I want to make sure you get that. The, the virus kills, over 500,000 people have died because of COVID-19. Black people and brown people have disproportionately been affected by it. Historic racism, um, systematic systems that have uh, denied proper health care to the community. We, we all have a responsibility as not just uh, black and brown people, but we have responsibilities as citizens of the world to make sure that we do our part to not only take care of ourselves, but take care of someone else. You've heard the doctor say it. <laughs> you gotta wear your mask. You, you got to wash your hands. We, we may have to social distance for a while, but, but if it helps us get back to the new better, then, then why not do it? This is only a moment in time. And, and so, let me, ladies and gentlemen, let me just encourage you to go get vaccinated. We, we know that some of us have been uh, somewhat uh, discouraged because of the lines or because of technology, but to hang in there. If we can survive 365 days of this environment, we can, we can be inconvenienced a little bit more. And so before you decide to throw in the towel and not get vaccinated, sign up, find the information necessary and do what you have to do. And then finally, for those who are maybe on the fence about getting vaccinated or not getting vaccinated, let me push you over the edge. Let me push you over the edge. This is our responsibility to make sure that we take care of our community and it starts with you and I. I took the shot, my wife took the shot, we are fine. My parents took the shot, they are fine. My in-laws took the shot, they are fine. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that we wanna go back to a new normal because the old normal wasn't the best. But I believe God has given us an opportunity to have a new better. And this vaccine is a part of the new better. And I encourage you, I implore you, not only as a faith leader, but as a father, a husband, and also a pastor, to take this opportunity, do what you have to do. And so we all can get back. As we say at the Breakthrough Fellowship, coffees and hugs, and then we can have barbecues and we can be in each other's presence. Because the thing that's missing most is community. And we can't have community unless we are vaccinated, unless we are safe. And, and so with that, let me give some final, some final thank yous. Let me also, uh, let me start with the, the greatest thank you. Let me thank uh, Reverend Jennifer Watley Maxell, my wife, who was uh, my uh, spotter, making sure she gets all the chats off of, uh, off of uh, Facebook. So let me thank her. Let me thank um, Kelly uh, Williams as all, as for all the work you did. Let me thank Con Jackson for being the director tonight. Let me thank Nicholas Woodruff for all the wonderful work that you did to help us put this together. Let me thank my church, the Breakthrough Fellowship, the best church in all the world, 1810 Spring Road right here in Smyrna, Georgia. If you don't have a church, we say it every Sunday. We're all about God and we're all about people. Let me also thank uh, some special sponsors. We said them earlier, but Radio One Atlanta, Tim Davies, you were amazing to allow us this platform and to help get this message out. And then finally, let me thank my friends at Project Light for believing in this project, promoting this project, and encouraging me and our church to lean into this moment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Real Talk with Reverend Cam, the, the Black, the, the vaccine and the Black community. Uh, until we are able to be in each other's presence, remember we're never far from God. Have a great night, everybody, and we will talk with you later.